first off, Rick did not announce, and oh my gosh, I already figured out, don't look it that way. So looking ahead to the camera, um, Rick didn't announce that I was his assistant. Like that is actually how our relationship began many, many, many years ago. And so um, I've had the opportunity to um, actually learn from many people in this room. There are past clients in this room, past partners, past associates, people that um, currently work with me. So um, it's very, uh, I'm feeling quite a bit of brand love inside this room today. So thank you very much for having me. So I'm gonna go through a little bit of a mini case study on um, Scott's miracle Grow and one of our new campaigns. And many of you can ask questions, validate, or contradict any of the information I will share because I've lived this with some of you that are in the room today. So thanks for that. So, oh, I have my own clicker. I forgot already. Okay, here we go. So building brand love, and today we're gonna talk about doing that with this fabulous character named Scott for Scots. And he has been something we have been pretty pleased with how we've extended him in the course of the year. So this is just a little mini journey through Scott's miracle Grow campaign history. So Scott's, and I said, you know, first sights of brand loves, as I couldn't come up with anything else to say as my headline. But we are, um, we have some fabulous things that people and everybody that's in this room that ever worked with or was part of Scott's can say all these things off the top of their head. They would know, they would start with number one up there, we are a 155 year old company. They would say that we have grown to dominance by the power of our supply chain. Some people actually taught me about that power that are sitting here today. We are strong retail partnerships. They drive our business. We have very concentrated business, which is a challenge for the future, but a fact and part of the reason we grew to the prominence where we are today. And then we also have superior innovation. We are the driving force of the category. So when you have all that going for you in column one, lots of love. Column two, brand awareness people die for. 90 plus brand awareness for our products and for our branded businesses, and that's pretty impressive. Also, historic levels of um, investment. So there's this one old commercial called Luby Lawns, which is um, interesting to say the least and not very um, appropriate for today. But it was spent, they spent millions of dollars quarter, I mean within, in the same 12 week period, every four weeks they spend lots and lots of money. So we have built and established patterns for the today's homeowner that the challenge is keeping them up, but um, they were invested and that's how people even know anything about lawn care. And then we also have a cultural entry point. So anyone that buys a house, you all of a sudden, you have to care about your lawn. You might only mow it. Our job is to make you want to do more than that. But you care about the lawn the minute you buy that house. And so with the cultural entry point, it makes it easier as a, you know, it's a tailwind for your business. But here's our reality. So um, fun fact, I love doing this with the little words on the side. It is my pro tip for any marketing person out there. You got a bunch of junk. You don't know exactly going to talk about it come up with a word, it makes it all easier. So my pro tip for the day. So here you go, COVID is over. COVID changed our business and you talked about the pizza business and how COVID um, changed that business. Talk about lawn and garden. We were definitely changed by that um, event in all of our lives. And so COVID grew our business. You, you couldn't stop our growth during COVID. So businesses that hadn't grown in years that were actually in a period of decline, all of a sudden taken off. And people love it. They didn't do, they did it, they had free time, which has always been a barrier. And I believe the author of the, if I had more time, if I had more money, and if I had more know-how, she is in the room, um, came true. So all those things happened. And we were, they all of a sudden had more time, they could learn what they needed to learn, and we were declared essential. And so lawn and garden remained an important part of many people's COVID experience for the betterment of Scott's miracle Grow. But COVID's over, lives are busy, kids are back at sports. Those are some real changes and we've had to adjust how we do our business because of it. The next one, household penetration. Household penetration is up, but in some categories it's dramatically down. So in the gardens business, it's way up. Pretty excited about that. That has, this is since COVID um, and as well year over year. Um, we have stayed up in the gardens business, but our, our fertilizer business, our lawns business, seed business continues to be challenged. And that is an important part of how the Scott's miracle Grow world goes round and round on the backs of both of those categories. So we've had some challenges as we look at what we are going to do to keep household penetration up, coming off of COVID again, they're busy. We don't want this to be the thing they drop out of their lives. Next, average purchase. Awesome news. 
people continue to spend money on lawn and garden products, continue to spend money on lawn and garden products at a little bit higher level than they did last year and even in COVID. But guess what? Prices went up. So there's a hot, lot fewer units in those baskets, and people are dropping out of entire categories, mostly because of the weather. The weather is not an excuse, but the weather is a real part of the business life at Scott's miracle Grow. So if you're getting ready to go to, the, to um, Home Depot or Lowe's or Walmart to buy some of your products, and you say, ah, this lawn looks pretty good, so you're going to skip that this year, and you're going to go ahead and do that. And there was record rain in the Northeast, Midwest, had really good weather. All of you that live here remember there's a really big frost in the, um, right after the weeds started to pop. It killed them, so they weren't there to remind you to go ahead and get um, your weed and feed down. And so we had some real challenges this year. And then it's not the same economy. Consumers are concerned. We had some, you know, the first little bit of bad economic news came in April. There's probably going to be some more right here right now as we head into fall, which is our other peak season. And 30% of our business is actually done in the fall. So that is another challenge. Then we have the gift of the generational shift. So our boomer audience, super engaged, still engaged, but they are dying. And then we have our Gen X and our millennials who are buying homes and excited to enter the category and actually have a DIY bent, which is pretty exciting to be sure we have the right content for them. But the generational shift is also a gift to the um, business or it's a curse because they have more money than time and they might decide just to outsource everything. So real challenges with generational shift and real opportunities. And then environmental concerns. So everyone is a little bit more concerned about what is in their yard. And at Scott's, we're sure we have an answer whether you want an organic solution or a synthetic solution, we'll be there to help you solve your problem. And that is another opportunity as you look at fragmenting product lines, fragmenting media choices, fragmenting investments, so we have to be able to navigate all of that as well. And we have to continue and can brand love, continue to instill trust within our brands. So on to the case study. Um, how are we going to drive the lawn business, lawns business in 2023? And so this was a challenge. The team that is in place now was a new team and all of a sudden had to come up with how we're going to turn things around, especially in the lawns business, which super growth in COVID super um, big gap to COVID um, sales in that first year, first year post COVID. So we were the team that had to do all we could do to try to turn things around. And this is part of that story. So we had this character, Scott for Scott from Scots. He was actually from Scotland. The actor was actually from Scotland. His name is Phil McKee. And he was how we were going to do this and we built an entire campaign around him. And he and his fun neighborhood friends would tell you how to go ahead and take care of your lawn. So it worked, it was a good campaign. It went away for a little while, it took a vacation, and we decided, what are we gonna do next? So it was time to reinvent and reimagine Scott for Scots. And how are we gonna do that with a modern twist? How are we gonna do that in today's environment where you can wrap a character in so many different places in so many different ways? So we knew it was a real opportunity, and so we took the challenge. So we found this guy. So any of you Game of Thrones fans, you know who he is. I don't remember his name. Somebody tell me. Something Giant Spain. <laughs> Thorman, Thorman Giant Spain is his name in the show. And so we brought Christopher in to help us remake and modernize the character. And we're pretty excited about it. So with our Game of Thrones guy, um, some enthusiastic marketing, an agency who'd been with us for a while, um, signed up to do a project work because that's where we were in sort of the phase of our financial lives. And we had to make a new campaign to do and answer all these questions. So who, we had to reach new homeowners, Gen X and millennials. We had to do what, core products. We had to extend and keep people in line with the products we have because with the challenges, we decided it wasn't a good year to launch new stuff. Where we needed to surround the audience. So how are we going to include? And we had been pretty modern in our media buying techniques. Part of that was because the shipyard was one of our partners. So we early on had a DMP and did all those things that to be sure you had the toolbox you needed to surround the consumer. And then we also needed to extend the season, which we'll get on to the fall campaign, hence the fall leaves on this page right here. So, but we did launch in the spring. And so the spring launch, like I think, I think somebody was going to do a video now. Yeah, here we go. So this was the campaign we built. First of all, just so you know, I'm breaking all my rules. I used to tell Rick. I used to tell Ricky. He always had too many videos in his presentation. I have too many videos in my presentation. Um, so I'm breaking my own rule that um, I tried to teach him. So anybody that worked with him now, does he still show too many videos? 
Oh, you don't do anything now? <laughs> okay. Well, that is good to know that you broke him of his habit. So this was a spot we did to help launch Scott, and it was to a new millennial homeowner audience. And some of the people that actually worked on this are also here today. So super proud of them and this work. So go ahead, Mr. Video Person or Miss. Wait. They have you surrounded. You're just going to stand there? Or they're going to take your loan back. We're going to take it back. With Scott's turf builder, Triple Action. Get three jobs done at once. It kills weeds, prevents crabgrass, and keep it growing strong. Glorious! Ah! No, no, no. Get a bag of triple action today. It's guaranteed. Feed it long. Feed it. So that worked pretty well, and actually it get led to some pretty great results. So um, just easy things to read right here, but foot traffic, another real challenge back to not the same economy. 53 million people did not go into lawns, did not go into the Home Depot or Lowe's this spring. That is a real challenge for our business. So we were able, though, with this increased advertising investment and this new campaign, we did um, drive some traction and drove some sales specifically of those products. So this campaign is seen as a success with market share gains. Um, we also had a day lawn savings event where we kicked off the season ourselves, which actually drove, um, drove really well sales in the south where we had better weather than we happen to have in the northeast. Again, weather is always a problem when you work at Scott's. And so we were able to increase the, or leverage the, we were able to offset some of that decrease from the foot traffic, and we're actually to be able to build a campaign that worked really well. So that was um, pretty awesome what we started in spring. And then, as I mentioned earlier, it's a third of our business in the fall, and so we really need to make the fall work really harder too, and that was sort of the extend the season on the previous page. And so we did that too, and I think that is going to be another campaign spot you're gonna show us right now, and this is the new fall spot, which is a rough cut, so um, don't tell anybody. Ah, the perfect day. Yeah, to put down some Scott's turf in the winter guard. It's perfect for giving the loan a boost this fall. Thank you, man. It's perfect for repairing all the fun I had this summer. No, it's perfect for strengthening roots to help protect it all winter. More like perfect for giving the grass a deeper green come spring. Sounds like it's perfect for your neighbor. Yeah, who's gonna take this back? Wait, what? Hand borrow your spreader. Thanks, guys. You're, You're welcome. Enjoy it. I'm going back in the shed. Pick up a bag of Scott's turf builder winter guard today. It's guaranteed. Feed your loan. Feed it. So multiple Scotties coming at you to tell you the multiple benefits um, in using that product right now at this time of the year and also, you know, just learning some lessons. We can't count on the dandelions. We can't count on the fall leaves to inspire you. So we're going to tell you all the reasons why you need to use this product now. And actually, you should use this product now. You will have a better lawn come spring if you apply some Winter Guard product to your lawns right now. So please be sure and do that. So really, right now, we're going to show how you got to love Scotty. But there's one more fun little thing we did to sort of demonstrate how we are surrounding our consumer and sort of picking up on some of the social trends people have been talking about. And this is one about the non, I'm going to say it wrong, the player, the, P, the video game thing, the non, what is it? Somebody give me the letters. It's NPG, non-player character, NPC. Non-player character, sort of a little spin on that. Go right ahead. Where am I? My name's Gary. Choose me. <laughs> uh, this is cool. I like this. So um, just really all the things you got to do to love Scotty. And so how are we going to get him all the places, all the different components, all the advertising things to build brand love, not only of the character, but the love of our brands. And so we've um, worked really hard to do that. We're on the beginning of this journey. We'll see how um, long it lasts and how long we can continue to push this campaign out there. But today they were just doing the um, re-record. Um, Christopher sometimes has work problems with TH sounds, and so we had to get some re-records out there. Strengthen the roots was not an easy sentence for him to say. So, um, so we had that re-record today that will go back into that commercial, that part you couldn't understand. He's going to be fixed by the time next time you see it on television. So um, that's really it for me on the pre-mumble part, um, a word Rick also made up and I have continued to put into my future. And um, please come up and join me.
Rick has one. Test us. Here we go. Hello. Okay. Oh, Great. I'm going to take a seat. I don't know about you. Yeah. But as we just discussed, I'm not used to wearing heels mm -hmm. uh, for no, any given I already have a band aid on. So, yeah, here we go. Um, well, thank you, Patty. That was so fun to hear more about Scotty, Scott's, and Scott's as a company. And I'm excited to talk to you today about how you lead the company's marketing efforts to engineer brand love. So, to start us off, it's really incredible to think of Scott's as a 155-year-old brand. So just in case you didn't do the math, that's 1868 the company was founded. Um, as one of America's most trusted companies with deep roots back to family, deep roots, I will also say I did a little A-B testing before we came up here with my team to see if I should integrate some gardening landscaping puns into the conversation today. Um, I'm kind of scanning around the room. It's no offense to younger crowds, but the 25-year-olds were not into it. It fell super flat, so I cut it out. Just know there are a ton of puns woven into my question. You won't be able to avoid it. It, it I, happens yes. automatically. It happens automatically. About the category. I will be winking inside, mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> but I'm not going to call it out every time. Okay, so with deep roots back to family, um, how do you translate that sense of trust and tradition to consumers via your marketing mix? Um, well, Scott's family is a super, super important part of everything we do. So it goes back to O.M. Scott, the guy that founded the company, and his, um, his big line is, farmers should have weed-free fields. And so that is written on the wall at Scott's miracle Grow. And so we really think about how um, O.M. Scott's legacy is brought forward. Then you have Horace Hagedorn, who is still famous inside the walls today, which is, find a need and fill it. The consumer is your friend and she is a gardener. He thought all the consumers were ladies back then. But we definitely um, are trying to do what Horace does. And then you have the modern day with Jim Hagedorn, who's Horace's son, and Jim's like, um, help people take care of their piece of the earth. And there's a very beautiful sentence written about that, but that sort of is the punchline of that, of how we think about how we do our job. So how do we help consumers take care of their piece of the earth. And so then we try to spread that, whether that's through new product innovation and advertising about that, or whether it's about trust and brand um, support that we try to do through our public relations or through our even our investor relations. We're just really sure that the family message continues to come through and how it connects back to our mission and, visions, and, mission and vision for the company. Well, you talked, to, obviously, showing the new spots with Scott slash Scotty. Is, was it was originally Scott, and now it's Scotty. It's, it originally was Scott the Scott, Scotland, okay. Scott for Scott Scots, Scott, Scotland. and now it's just yes. Scott for Scots. Okay, so it's not we, Scotty. We call him internally, or his friends call him Scotty. Okay, so I'm going to refer to him as Scotty. So I did a little digging on Scott's commercial that you shared mm -hmm. at the end of your presentation, and I read through some of the comments on the YouTube channel over the past few months. There were dozens and dozens of comments. Um, a few of which I've included. If you're also inclined to humor me, I'm going to read a couple of them. Scott is back. The best ideas never really die, do they? And also keep in mind, are there Game of Thrones fans in here? Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, tie back to that. So Scott, he dies in the show. Okay. Okay. <laughs> After the climate improved north of the wall, Tormund Giants Giantsbane decided to become a lawn care specialist. This is my personal favorite, which I think that you might have seeded actually, as a company, but I am we the Italian, yep, thank you. I am the Italian version of Scott. I am D'Angeli of the Northeast, and when I won the 2021 Lawn Care Nut Award, I yelled exactly like that as I conquered the weeds in Green War III, using the Scott's triple action as my cannon. Scott and I would be incredibly interesting neighbors as fellow lawn enthusiasts. Thanks for the tips, Scott. I, mean, I think you seeded that one, but that's okay. Um, and the last one, I just love these commercials. All of these really tie back to that brand love and show a testament um, to being true to your brand, empowering consumers through connections with your product and engineering that extreme brand love. Could you chat through some of the insights in creating this commercial and the thought behind bringing back Scott? Sure. So um, somebody who I used to work with back in the day, which was with some of the other people here again, it's a big theme of my talk today, said you need to be sure your brand lives in people's shopping carts, not just in their memories. 
And so that is an important thing for the Scotts brands. We have to always continue to put our brand out there and be forward and be modern and modernizing. So that was a big risk of like, ah, eh, we're kind of going backwards. But we thought with all the fun we could have with him and how we modernized him and made him a recognizable celebrity this time as opposed to just a character actor, that was part of, we thought we could just make more with it when we did it this time. So that was part of the, the insights. And also, it is a category where consumers don't know very much about it, so a spokesperson also is helpful. But we wanted a spokesperson that could introduce other spokespeople. So you'll see, um, you saw Dr. Scott there in that little clip. But Dr. Scott will introduce the fabulous R&D people at Scott's or the fabulous salespeople or doing those kind of things. So we really just saw the way that we could use him to surround content, not just surround um, the consumer retail part of it. And so um, we gave it a go. Our retail partners are really excited about bringing him back, too. So having some sort of anchor to speak to, again, being the largest brand in the category, other than our retailer brands, we really are the primary advertising voice. And so you need us to be loud. And having an anchor um, helps us do that. And I love a lot of the words that you use. There's all this excitement around testing and trying new things and bringing back a character that was so beloved amongst consumers. I think. You hear a hundred, a hundred and fifty-five year old company. Surely they're going to be stagnant in their ways, and it's exciting to hear that you're willing to take risks. So, so God's Miracle Grow is built to take risks. That's oh, what we yeah, do. Yes, that's true. You do <laughs> achieve those three core, three, four, four, three. We do it. We keep Crab it busy. Crabgrass, weeds. Oh, that that um, kills and third prevents. One? Kills and prevents. Well, I'm buying it. So, um, and, for, well, and fertilizes. And fertilize it. That's Did I get the them right, thank John? You. Did I list them all? Okay, thank you. You got a thumbs up. Yeah. Resounding. Um, I'd love to take a moment to dig in on your sponsorship of the Children's Garden at the Franklin Park Conservatory. And if I may share, this is particularly special to me for two reasons. I have a two and a three and a half year old, um, and we probably go to the conservatory to go to visit the Children's Garden at least once a month. This was a two time a month, um, we just went on this past Sunday. And I love that even at their ages, they know that they wanna walk in the special entrance to the children's garden. They wanna go play with the musical instruments. They w love the educational programs, which not to be basic, but especially around fall are amazing. Um, and thanks to my family's love of the children's garden, I know this is a common denominator we have for a love of the conservatory. I'm um, joining the women's board, and I know that, sorry, we won't be at Wonder Bus because both of us I will be- I won't be there either. Yeah, both of us will be at the field to table, field to table dinner. Um, but with all of that, thank you again for humoring me. Great crowd. I was hoping you could speak a little bit of your sponsorship of the evolution of the sponsorship of the children's garden and how you really nurture that relationship. Sure, it goes back to um, really what Jim and many people um, along the journey of being in charge of this sort of area at Scott's Miracle Grow. We are really work hard to be sure our philanthropy is authentic to who we are and what we believe in. So, you know, we are troubled when people put grass football fields like in Ohio Stadium. And that's a reason we don't really have a big sponsorship with Ohio State because of that. We're still sponsors because we care about our community. But the Children's Garden was a super easy one for us to become involved with. We had been involved with them for Grow 1000, which was um, building community gardens. And we actually built one of the Grow 1000 gardens is the community garden at the backside at um, behind the Wells Barn, mm -hmm. which um, you will see at the, when you see on the conservatory grounds. Mm -hmm. And then it became a natural extension when they approached us to be the named sponsor of the Children's Garden, and we couldn't pass it up. And so we've really enjoyed every connection with that organization and how we continue to grow that, whether through philanthropic efforts and donations, but also we do things with them on um, Earth Day. So on Earth Day, if you are a community um, garden, you can go and Scott's Miracle Grow donates all kinds of products, and we are all there, the associates loading your trucks, and helping them move around. So be sure that everyone gets off to a good start in the spring season. So we just really try hard to um, connect our philanthropy with our mission. And that's on a corporate level, and I didn't put this in our notes, but I so I don't mean to throw you off, but you, would you mind talking a little bit about your personal involvement um, from a philanthropic standpoint, either within Scott's or specific to the conservatory? Sure. I'm, I'm a believer in the arts, so I support the arts as Patty Ziegler, the human. And Patty <laughs> Ziegler, the associate, um, found a nice way to do both with the Franklin Park Conservatory. <laughs> and so um, we do continue to, um, I continue my effort with them as part of the um, development committee is what I am on. And one day maybe I'll get to be on the board. I keep working for that, but we'll have to wait and see. It's a very complicated board full of you. community. Oh, no. 
No, it's full of community. Wait, really? um, you have to be nominated by something to do with political parties and things like that. So um, hmm. I'm on the list. We'll see. I'm kind of confused but, with how I wiggled my way in there, but yeah. it's okay. It's regard. It's um, the so point. that's really what I love about the. I, I, I mean, Hat Day is just super fun. If you've not been to Hat Day, it's fun. It's worth going. This year they sold out. Only corporate tables. Um, it really is a nice way to start your spring and also think about getting back and giving back to a very worthwhile cause. The community garden, the gardens throughout our community that the Franklin Park sponsors, whether it's with know-how or financial donations, it's really just a great place. And then the kids' children's garden, especially if you haven't, it's, it's fall, then there's also holiday. It's worth going out there for the holidays, especially anybody with trained children. There's lots of cool train things that are out there at that, at that time of year, too. So I just continued to stay with the philanthropy at the... Franklin Park, and then otherwise it's the arts for me. Ballet Met, if you haven't if you haven't bought your season tickets, they are also on sale starting today. The company is back. Um, so that's where I put my efforts. Well, and speaking of, I think Conservatory at Glow, the sales went on. Yeah. The sale tickets happen today. There you go. And also so. the, the summer events where you just like, it's like um, happy hour kind on Thursday nights are, are pretty mm -hmm. fabulous. As when there's one also at the Columbus Museum of Art does a Thursday afternoon sort of outside gathering. All these in their... They're essentially free. They're free, but you buy a $10 drink. So there is um, ways to go ahead and get involved in the community and explore new things that might not be part of your life. As a creative executive, that's what I always try to stick with the arts. <laughs> well, thank you for that. Um, again, I think we really connected when we were able to chat about that. And whether or not you have kids, a children's garden is a beautiful place. So be sure to check it out and Scott's sponsorship. So shifting gears a bit, not to get into the weeds, but we've discussed you've done a significant amount of work within the e-com space over the past few years with the launch of Indeed um, and some of the off-store Macy's, the sure. market. Um, I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about the products and executions and ultimately how they ladder to engineering brand love for the portfolio. Yeah, we learned a lot pre-COVID and during COVID with our, I mean, there, there are many people in the audience who know what I'm going to talk about now, with um, digitally native brands. So we really were early to explore, and we came up with innovations and launched all kinds of things, and we're really on the right road until um, iOS happened to us, and then targeting payment became a little bit more difficult. And so we had to shift gears, and we've now um, built some of those brands within our larger branded houses where they have more investment. But the biggest thing about e-commerce at Scott's was it was an orphan. Nobody wanted to care about e-commerce. There was actually discussions about, should we even list our products on Amazon? Um, I stood up and said, yes, and I'll be in charge of it. And so um, we built a team for e-commerce that um, you know, predated COVID and had built the right tools and had built the partnerships with our retailers and had inventory in all those places. And then COVID hit, and we were a big part of the, the COVID business, a big part of the success. Um, and a big part of why so many millions of gardeners entered the category at that time and why we're still selling stuff to them today. Thank you. And this is along the same lines, but and we haven't, um, it's not necessarily tied directly to brand love, but we know not all roads are smooth traveling and we hate to fail, but we know that failure is a great teacher. We would love to hear from you on how you weathered a failure and turned it into a positive. I had to write this down so I could remember. <laughs> now I got to find your question on what the, my answer was going to be. I think I moved it around a little. Oh, you did? Oh, man. Okay, well, I'll just wing it. Um, so. Do you want me to tee you up? No. What, you what wrote, did I say last time? We had our third best year in history. Oh, yeah. This is awesome. Third best year in history. Aren't you all excited? <laughs> yeah. No. Didn't hit plan. We didn't hit the plan, so it's terrible. So that is um, one of the fabulous things in a learning opportunity. So. You can have something that you're super proud of and something that you achieved and delivered a bunch of things. But if you don't hit the plan, you have to own that too. And so that was a big learning for the team and um, a big important lesson that a key takeaway from us is um, you need more than one K management. Executive management needs more than one KPI. And so we will go into this year with a bunch of different KPIs as well as the key one of sales. But there are some things that happen that you know, can't be offset, whether it's the weather, whether it's Home Depot and Lowe's and their foot traffic and the macroeconomic environment. Like I can't, I can't fix that. Wish I could, but I didn't. And so um, that was a big learning from this year, like to have such a great year on the lawn for the company, uh, the lawns branded business, it was on that slide. While the category is still um, declining, Branded business was up three. 
So we are continuing to outpace everyone else in the category. Our advertising worked and is growing the business, but it's still a sick category that we're going to have to attend to to um, help make sure it's as successful as it was in the COVID years. And with all of those changes, I have a little bit of a two-pronged question for you. Um, again, with the ever-evolving media landscape, how do you value brand marketing versus performance marketing? I, I'm hearing you guys are getting it. I appreciate that. Um, and how do you lear lean into your partners in executing those strategies to cultivate success to, and ladder all, up ultimately to brand love? Yeah, I mentioned that earlier in some of the, again, um, working with the shipyard as well as our other agency partners, performance marketing is an important part of the mix. And so is um, developing a brand affinity and brand attraction. And in COVID, one thing that happened in our portfolio anyway is the pond was overfished. And so um, we all got super good at COVID, at conversion, bottom of the funnel activity, how we were investing. We weren't going to invest. We, we had great ROAS, like we were doing all those things. But then when you look at the future, you got to fill that top of the, the uh, top of the pond as well. And so that is big something that we always have to be sure we have the right, we have a balance. So we know how much conversion tactics. We also, um, the rise of retail media. So our biggest retailers both have retail media platforms and um, Home Depot and Lowe's. And so a lot of the performance dollars sort of shift to their funnels, Amazon as well. And so it sort of changes the mix. So when we look at brand and performance, it's across all our media investments to be sure that we um, level that out to be sure everyone is still spending enough money to get people into the category. And again, I didn't put this down, but you just sparked um, a thought that I had in regards to the actual purchase funnel and consumers are they purchasing your product on Amazon? Are they purchasing it for pickup at the retailers that you're really invested in? What does that consumer journey look like? Uh, it, yes. Um, the consumers want to buy our product in the store. They want to buy it online. They want it shipped to their home. They want Bopus. Um, the biggest challenge is some of our products are big, bulky, and alive. So there is some um, things like that with live goods. And so in the COVID, and um, we really worked through how we we're going to get consumers' product to their homes. And then when the world sort of settled down, you have to look a little bit more to the cost effectiveness of that. Bopis is a big, important part of what our retailers do, but they don't do it for mulch because it's big and bulky, or they don't do it for this, and you have Instacart at Lowe's, and you can do every product except lawn and garden. And so there's still work to do, but the consumer will win. Consumers want this product. Um, easy, efficiently, and when they want it. And, you know, um, start anywhere, finish anywhere. It's a real big truth in our business. So the SAFA consumer is going to get what they want when they want it, and we have to help them do it. So partnerships with um, smaller retailers, bigger retailers. We do every test Amazon comes up with to test for delivery. Um, our retail partners are doing some work in specific markets. Um, consumers want lawn and garden products. They want to pick them up some days, and other days they want them to show up. They want to order them on Wednesday and know they'll be there on Friday so they can get their project done. Makes sense. I feel like I'm one of those consumers as well. So we also talked a little bit about this in terms of targeting a boomer audience, which I think you said the boomers, they're dying, the millennials are buying their new, house, their new homes, and I like to give the analogy my father pretty much blasted through the HOA and hand built his own little oasis in his backyard. So there's like a babbling brook and a huge pond and 10 inch koi. And he told me the other day that they'll have to take him out of a body bag before he leaves that house because he loves his backyard so much. And I'm on the exact flip side where we live in a new neighborhood. And I always say that the great thing about a new neighborhood is that it's new. And the bad thing about a new neighborhood is that it's new. And we don't have developed trees and, um, lush vegetation and all those things, if you will. So how are you balancing the conversations and the product offerings to both sets of consumers, or really all consumers, if you will, within the product category? It's important, um, especially the educational message sort of goes across all, um, all audiences. But we have to be sure that we're meeting the needs of the modern consumer, and that means we have to have a lot more innovation. So um, triple action is a direct response to the consumer insight that the younger consumer does not have time to put four applications of stuff on their lawn. So we put three in one. So that you know changes the economics of many, many, many things, but it really was a delivery for the consumer that delivered on what they wanted to do and how they wanted to consume the category. The boomer likes it too because they have less time they have to invest and they can use the same product. So whether it's um, product innovation or media targeting, another way we're sure we reach all the audiences, it's important to do both. And we still have a number of years. Like the lines haven't crossed yet on the chart, but um, we need to keep doing both. 
And you mentioned innovation, and I would love to chat a little bit more about that, as I imagine that research and development um, aspect of your company is critical to your overall success in, in order to also gain consumer trust. Can you talk a little bit about how the different sectors of the company support each other and how you work together? Yeah, um, innovation, We one thing we did at Scott's early on was they created an innovation and technology committee um, and since I've been there. And this group of people actually works with board members and the most important thing we did was come up with key benchmarks. And so we established like what is the goal, the financial goal that innovation has to drive every single year. And then you let loose and you have the brand teams and their R&D partners, you let them loose to figure out how to do it. So inspiration, insights come from the consumer insights team, come through the brand leadership team. Um, field sales, field sales comes up with ideas. You know, consumers really put this thing down and then they go buy that thing or they say they wish they had this thing. And so those are other places we drive all that innovation ideas and ideation. And then we have a, a pretty rigorous process, which I always get the letters wrong. So Sadie, what is it? ICPD. Um, is the name of the process, and that is how we um, move everything from, and she's going to have to tell you what they even stand for. Idea, concept, proof, development. And so every, idea, concept, proof, development. And so every idea at Scott's moves through all those phases, and it's a staging gate process to get investment, and it works really pretty great. Lovely. Um, along those lines, I would like to take it back to the top, if you will, to talk about Scott's overall mission, which is helping the world grow a little more extraordinary. And of course, that lends itself naturally to developing a greater sense of good. And I was curious if you had a favorite example of a recent execution, maybe Scott, Scott, Scotty aside, um, across any division of the company that you truly think brings your mission to life. Um, I think we are mentioned it earlier, and I have no idea how much time we have left. So yeah, somebody you. give I us mean, the time check here. We got five. Okay. So um, Franklin Park Conservatory. It is a really nicely connected program to our mission and um, supported by many executives inside of Scott's. And pretty excited to see where we take that to the next level and how you use that footprint and take it to other cities. So we have a program around, um, you know, back to the environmental concerns on my slide, like um, water positive landscaping. Like we have a real concern in this country about how you use water and what's the appropriate percentage of your yard that should have green grass in it. But grass does sequester carbon, so don't hate on it too much, people. Um, but you have to be sure that you have the right resources to promote the safe landscape. And so that's another program we're really proud of, Water Positive Landscaping. And we partnered with HGTV. And there's actually out there, depending on where you live, you can pick um, native plants and things that are good for your area that will help you continue to contribute to um, supporting a healthy climate. Lovely. Yes, um, are there any questions? Should I just run the mic? I'm happy to. So you guys can see if I can practice in the heels. Hi, um, you mentioned it was important for your philanthropy to be authentic and consistent with your brand. Would you say the same thing about your ESG programs more broadly? And what would you say to marketers who today seem to be struggling with finding the right balance between demonstrating their values to consumers who increasingly demand that as part of their condition for loving the brand, but also having struggling with the backlash, you know, Target, Bud Light, et cetera. What would you say to marketers about how to be authentic and yet still demonstrate those values? Yep, I mean, the ESG team is an, an active team within the marketing world at Scott's. And so we partner across the organization, across you know, HR, consumer affairs, and um, public relations, government relations, issues management. And we just are continuing to work, make progress, set appropriate goals. Um, our retailers are pretty active as well. And so they are part of the guiding hand is how we um, do this. But brands have to be loved by the people. And so it is an important thing every brand has to consider. And so far, you know, sticking to our authenticity and how it connects back to us is, um, has been a true course. Hello. Um, you talked on this a little bit, but I just wanted to hear your perspective. Uh, such a big organization as a CMO, how you're keeping a holistic picture, the ability to zoom in and zoom out, and how you're approaching day in and day out, month in and month out, how you keep that holistic picture but, but know where you're going. You have a great team. So that is um, really how we're organized at Scott's. There are specific teams. There's the marketing services side, which is um, OMG, because they wouldn't name it, so I call it, it's now one marketing group. 
because they wouldn't name themselves. And then we have um, our brand team. So you have the lawns team, the controls team, and the gardens team. And so with those team leadership, and we set out every single day to talk about what is you know current. We also, as a seasonal business, have a nice cadence and how we prepare for going into our selling season. We talk, there's an old joke at Scott's, like there's two seasons at Scott's, there's a the selling season and the PowerPoint season. And so we continue to just um, work on communicating effectively to all our constituents to keep everything moving forward. Thank you. Patty Ziegler, Jen Jensen.